Can you get okay, these are women? We'll have to have a contest. One thing before I get started. I just want to say like the craziest story that happened. I almost died coming in. I'm being a little dramatic though, obviously, but uh, I know I am dramatic. Um, so I drove in, it was a little rainy. Oh, I see. And uh, the GPS said it was an accident about four miles ahead of me. And then I looked at the clock and it was about 4.44 and I was like, whoa. And then I looked at my phone again, and it was 44 minutes before you get there. And if anyone is superstitious, four is a very unlucky number, right? So uh, in Chinese culture, just, <laughs> I'm not Chinese, but I'm superstitious. And uh, it freaked me out. And then I started feeling better because I realized that my clock was wrong because of daylight savings. It was actually 3.44, but I, and I put this on Instagram just now. I actually got to the office at 4.44. Oh. So that was like bad omens. If there are any wizards in the <laughs> audience, please protective spell anywhere around the vicinity of my body. Would be great. Uh, please. All right, so uh, yeah, I already got the intro. Product design lead uh, at Eventbrite. Um, before that, oh, yeah, so. I do a lot of experimentation. Uh, a little bit about terminology. So the topic is about A-B testing, and experimentation is frankly interchangeable for the purposes of this talk. So as I'm talking about experimentation, it's exactly what people have been talking about. Um, it's really about metrics, data-driven design. Oh, flicker. Hmm. All right, so like I mentioned before, I'm a product design lead here at Eventbrite. Let me get out of the way a little bit. Uh, so some of the team affectionately calls me Design Dad <laughs> because I, I manage a few of them. And I brought the most Design Dad photo from a recent uh, outing <laughs> where I am literally the only one wearing a Hawaiian shirt looking super cool <laughs> while everyone else is very designer black shirts situation. Uh, so I couldn't help myself when I was trying to talk about myself. This is very me here. A wine shirt, awkward as hell. Uh, also, um, I'm classically trained uh, sculptor and an animist. A little fun fact. Uh, when I was talking to Andy about this evening, we were geeking out over sculpture because she had started taking classes about it. So I was like, oh, I could talk about this all day. Now I gotta add it to my slide. Um, also, according to my wife, I'm the world's loudest chip eater. So I had to put that in, they just taste better when you're like ah, munching on them. Uh, but seriously, um, currently at Eventbrite, formerly at one of the Expedia Group companies, Hotwire, so my team came out, so shout out. Thank you guys. Um, before that, I started my own consulting agency, Splendor, and I got a chance to work with a lot of really big companies, really tiny companies. It was a lot of fun. And also previously creative director for another small startup. Um, so why am I here? Uh, Essentially, over the years, I've, I've come up with a lot of strategies based on rinse and repeat. You see these patterns all the time. Jane, uh, she just went on earlier. I told her we're best friends now, just because a lot of the stuff that she was talking about is exactly the kind of thing I work with teams to better articulate their hypotheses, user problems, experimentation, uh, and research. Right? The Hawaiian shirt is a good look. Uh, not today, though. I'm wearing my Eventbrite black <laughs> new shirt. See, I'm trying to fit in with the, the other ones. Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> anyways, for, uh, on to the lessons. Um, the first lesson, remember it's about the user, not what you want. So what do they want? Um, to the point made earlier, uh, you have to focus in on why they're here. I was, a, a little backstory on this uh, case study. I wasn't the designer attached to it, but because they were on leave, I came in mid-project to better understand what I can do to help ship it. And the product manager really wanted a pop-up 
with multi-select and oh and they can also select their own uh, points of interest and because of that we're going to need another overlay and they're going to animate in and I was like what what are what are we talking about what is this <laughs> I, I came in very worried about the direction and when I asked okay so how are we going to measure su success they, they looked at me and said it's interaction with the feature and I was like wait a minute so that's the the equivalent of of asking for a high five and then saying that it was successful because I got a high five <laughs> like that user wasn't there to to play with your experiment uh, this is a uh, in this example the to your point earlier it was about conversion I can get behind that story so I add this functionality that increases my confidence in my search I thus uh, increase conversion because I increase confidence. I can get behind that story all day long, but if you're telling me you're going to benchmark the success of the experiment based on the experiment itself, when you don't have a baseline, uh, what are you comparing it to? It, it makes no sense. Uh, so just something I talk about is like your users aren't here for your experiment. They have an end goal in mind unless you're a social network, that you can do whatever you want. <laughs> so the lesson, remember, keep the user at the center of your work. Yep. Uh, and, I, and we already talked about the tools, but how do we do that? It's about reframing user problems, user journey maps, all that stuff. The second lesson, it keeps coming up, psychology, not just pixels. So what do I mean by that? I think we've heard design is about the experience, how it works. I'm not actually talking about that. I know that uh, Katie Dill talks about it's 99% experience. What I'm talking about when I say psychology, not just pixels, I'm talking about the psychological principles that help define our work that sometimes predicts irrational behavior. People aren't rational all the time. You see it in behavioral economics so that's why it's important. I get blank stares uh, often when I <laughs> talk about this as if I've just said the worst thing ever as a designer. Uh, what do you mean, you're, you're going to manipulate people? And if you only knew the power of the dark side, I'm kidding. <laughs> the, the <laughs> what, I, what I'm getting at is that it's like Nira, y'all mentioned in his hook book. It's about how you use the tools, but it's not about not using psychology or understanding how people make choices. It's really about knowing that tool and those levers so you can use them in your own work. But obviously, uh, be true to your brand. So an example that we often used, um, what I love about conversion levers is, is that uh, they're really easy to repeat. Um, you use them in commerce a lot. Again, it's conversion funnels, and what you're trying to do is, is predict uh, how someone will react to this addition or subtraction, frankly, with friction. But again, the, the purpose that I bring this up is if you're not able to articulate to me what the psychology of your work is, then I don't really know that you understand what you're talking about. Uh, another really fun example that I have a case study for is the endowment effect. How many people have heard about the endowment effect? Cool. So it's this really interesting um, quirky principle where people put more value on something that they own, also referred to as loss aversion. People talk about it that way. Uh, and you've seen this in lab studies where people would have a mug, and if I own that mug, I think it's $5, but if you own that mug, I think it's $3. And why people don't give up lottery tickets, even though I'm going to pay you $20 to give, you that, give me that lottery ticket that you have not won anything from. It's really bizarre, right? But it's, it's super interesting how we make choices. So one example uh, that I thought about in checkout was what if we were to reorganize the mobile flow so that they entered 
their information first. And because then they had a sense of ownership for it, maybe they would be more likely to convert and, and then swap out the order for the, for the price summary. Uh, yeah, I come from travel. This is the kind of thing we did. Uh, and it worked pretty successfully. Um, but again, this is one of many examples. You can find them, uh, sunk cost bias, et cetera. But so use psychology when you're describing your work or framing your work, but be ethical if you can. <laughs> All right. uh, third lesson, this is probably the biggest one. Um, get the small things right first. So this is a, a quote from every growth designer ever about how I feel like I'm throwing spaghetti at the wall and waiting for something to stick. I think I've heard that more than any other thing when it comes to growth. There's a problem with this. Uh, and you start going crazy, you think, <laughs> I, ha I have to figure this out. Um, maybe it was this other thing, or, or, or maybe I didn't do enough. That I didn't do enough is the one that is the hardest to try to determine. So one of a very articulate quote here that I won't butcher uh, comes from one of our principal software engineers. And we were working on, on experimentation together. And he, and he asked me, how do you know we proved it wrong versus we implemented it wrong? Uh, that, again, is the bias to think I need to do more up front. And I told him, well, it's the thing that keeps us up at night, honestly. PMs and designers, I'm like, I, did I do that right? I, I don't know if I, if I did enough. Maybe I should have uh, done something else, uh, especially when you're getting flat or inconsistent results based on other research. So the, the, the outcome of th both of these is that either teams are running really small, incoherent uh, nonsense, frankly, or, <laughs> or really <laughs> large over-indexing, essentially defeating the purpose of experimentation. You're, you're not actually not. Uh, mitigating risk because you just built everything. Just <laughs> ship it then if, you, if you're that worried about it. So it really comes down to our incentives being wrong. And designers especially, we, I think we live in this space where, let's say because your OKRs are, are, are broken, you, you think it's all about winning, right? Growth mindset, growth hacking. But it's really experimentation is about learning. Did I learn the hypothesis that I was after? So uh, my solution to all of this is the cupcake analogy that people are snickering in the back. <laughs> uh, at my last company, I was uh, sometimes referred to as Officer Cupcake <laughs> because I would really grill my teams. I was design ops at, the, at that time, and I was really trying to understand their work. Uh, frankly, tr let me just say you don't need the wedding cake version. What you need to do is make sure you get all of the ingredients right up front. Uh, I love this quote from the Systems Bible. Um, it's Gaul's Law. Is essentially, you, you can't start uh, a complex system up front. Every system that works, every complex system that works started from a really simple system that worked. A complex system cannot be made to work up front. So you want to make cupcakes. What are the ingredients? That's why Jane is my best friend. Because, I love this slide so much. Oh my God. yeah, Mad again, huh? Oh. Think of that. So you'd be surprised how, how few people actually use these things, right? And that's why I started putting in what is the thing that I need to insert here. So it's the who, the persona, so what do, they, what do they need? What's the need? And then why do they want it? So the motivation. If you can't articulate that, you don't have a user story. Thank you, Jane. <laughs> I feel like I have a ringer. Uh, yeah, so, and then the other one, uh, I should have started with the top one first, right? That, that makes more sense. A design. Uh, so by X, I expect Y measured by Z. 
the last one is kind of important because uh, I think we say it differently, but if you don't have a metric, if you don't have a m variable, you don't have a hypothesis. You have a statement. All right. So this is an example. I'm not going to try to butcher it here. But if I am improving error handling, I expect less so signups, accidental, real world use case for us, measured by signup rate and call volume. Did we see it? Absolutely we did. Because we knew what we were going to measure up front. We knew what we thought the outcome was going to be. I was able to articulate the point um, pretty clearly. And we didn't need full page docs, actually. Like in one statement, everyone got it. And who was it for and why do they want it? Because they, they want to know if they made a, a typo. Our error handling wasn't good. They blew right through sign up without noticing that they actually made a typo, creating a new phantom account. So the lesson here is to remember to get the little things right first. Um, all of your little ingredients, that cupcake, is, is the key. Without that, there's no point in building the big thing. Because you can make a big piece of feature <laughs> <laughs> and, and you're missing the eggs. You didn't actually like get the batter right. Um, last point. Uh, so this, this story is about humility, people, <laughs> and um, impact. Oh, before I get to that one, <laughs> actually, I want to talk about uh, a topic I, I often bring up and when I'm not talking about cupcakes, I'm talking about uh, a term I coined, BS Mountain. So BS Mountain is something that happens when you start your career, you don't know anything. As you get more senior in your career, I know everything. And then you get really old and you realize you don't know anything again. <laughs> How does that happen? <laughs> um, my version of that was I didn't know anything. I knew everything because I could do everything with experiment and 20 pounds heavier. And then I got older, and I don't know anything, and I'm 40 pounds up here. <laughs> um, I don't know why I said that. Oh. <laughs> so the story about impact. I was getting really good at incremental experimentation. I love my little sparklers. I felt really good when I got that 1% lift. But what I was really missing was the, the big rocket that I was after. So I, I knew all the tricks. I know psychology. I could get you to click on things you don't want to. Um, <laughs> but what was I doing? I wasn't really having that success that I, I was looking for with just experimentation alone. So that's the humility piece that starts with, I know it's an obvious point, designers in the room, it's about people. But you get so caught up in drinking the Kool-Aid of the growth hacking mindset that you forget, you lose your grounding, your North Star. So if you're able to then just talk to people, researchers, um, users, you're able to then understand things that you weren't even looking for. That's your 10x. You're going to find bigger opportunities just by sitting down with folks. So um, I brought in a little case study. I launched it uh, right before I left my last rule. Uh, it, it didn't start off with, again, all the tricks I knew before. I had just a weird curiosity about this one module that had a, a strong relationship with retention, so I knew it was important. But it's a, a sentiment score after purchase. A lot of companies have these, like Square and whatnot. So I was just curious about how people were using it. And so we ran user after user, and it was just watching watching them, just an observational study. And it became painfully obvious what we had to do with 15 people. I mean, I would have wished I found it with five, but I wanted to be sure. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not a great researcher, so I, I, ha I needed extra data. Uh, so we changed the copy. We, ch we added some more clear uh, data points. 
improve the contrast. And then I get, uh, and, and I, it, so we launched it after I left, and I get a really fuzzy image from uh, my old PM. And he was like, your thing is blowing up. Just, just so you know, we should go for stakes. Uh, our OKRs are done uh, for this metric. Uh, just wanted to bring it up. So I got my, it's not quite 10x, it's 2x. But I got a much bigger lift than I was looking for. It, it wasn't that incremental um, lift that I was used to. It, it, something that blew the doors off of what anyone was expecting just by watching people. So remember to understand the people behind the numbers. I lost sight of that. I'm not going to let it happen again. Um, that's actually why I'm here. Eventbrite is very user centric. We, like this is the DNA of this company. Um, and I'm trying to get better at this every day. Thank you. Um, I'm not really on Twitter much. I put it up there. But uh, you can get me at the Adrian at Eventbrite if you want to get me directly. I, I won't see it for years on Twitter. Do we have any questions? Uh, yep. Questions, questions, right here. Um, thank you very much, that was awesome. Um, I had a question on, uh, you know, you both have kind of like talked about uh, having experience and clearly defining like those statements. What do you do when you don't have a clear understanding of what your baselines are on a team? So for example, when you're a small company and you're moving very quickly, Usually you can rely heavily on experimentation to get those 10% gains, but then at the end of those, your team doesn't have like a firm understanding of actually even what your baseline conversion is because you sacrifice maybe um, getting an understanding of what your analytics are. Um, and then my second question is, is when you define goals for experiments, you know, we want to get X percent better, how do you go about defining those as a team? Um, I'll I think I'll answer the second one first. So how do we define the metrics that we're going to? Uh, like how do you find the, sorry. The hypothesis? Uh, no, not the hypothesis, just the percent goal that you're shooting for. Ah. So if you have your metric and understanding, you have your hypothesis, but how do you go about defining I an actual list that you want to target as a team? And how do you kind of like, you know, I um, decide what's successful? I personally don't try to guess because I'm going to be wrong all the time. Um, but what, again, back to that last point, if I see a big enough problem or opportunity, that's what's going to drive me to do the work. It's not because I expect 10% or 100% lift. I just see the problem. The and, it, and, and because I see the problem, I, it's, uh, it warrants the, the work. Um, and uh, th I mean, there's other uh, prioritization that happens before that. So as you're looking at different options, the, what I would do is rather than try to guess what you're going to, the outcome, you're going to measure relatively to the opportunities you have. So you have XYZ problems or hypotheses and um, you focus on the ones you think are going to, you have more evidence about like you, you expect is a bigger problem. Don't focus on the little things that aren't going to move the needle. Uh, the first one, I forget. Can you? Uh, just what, what do you do if you're like at a company that doesn't have a firm understanding of like what your baselines are for the metrics you think about? I think if you don't have the baseline, you can't really run an experiment. Um, frankly, I think uh, you, part of experimentation is you're running two, two or more variants against each other. Um, and if you don't know the, the baseline, you, you don't even know that there's a problem. So I don't know that. If you don't have that kind of grasp, it's e it even warrants an experiment or, or that type of work. Maybe a validative testing with a few folks. Okay, we have time for one more question and then we have to um, carry on. Carry on. I saw you raise your hand. There you go. Um, thank you for the talk. I'm curious, um, what if you run an A-B testing and then the result is totally opposite to your design inspiration? Um, but ideally, you should go back to talk to the users, but what if you don't have like, enough time or resources? Um, how would you decide in that situation? So again, I think if you did everything right up to that point, um, 
you did a good job. It, again, it wasn't about winning. It was about learning the outcome. You, you're, not, you're not the driver. The user's the driver. They, they decide. Does that make sense? And right. final, one more, one more question, because Ram is awesome. Because ours was cupcake question. OK. <laughs> My yeah. favorite so thing. Working in like, multiple startups to embrace the whole iterative mindset, um, I find most of the designs where the experiments are good aren't cupcakes. They're, They're very like big. fondant icing or a <laughs> slice of cake. I wonder if you have tips or advice on how do you make sure Sitting a smaller feature, but that's a whole uh, rather than you are just building like a, a component. Yeah. Uh, so again, they're using experimentation, frankly, wrong, because you're trying to mitigate that extra work that didn't need to be there, right? So when you're struggling, trying like this, you have to do this early though. Try to get the teams to articulate. The hypothesis you say all, all the, the what I'm getting at is what are those ingredients? You can come up with a smaller version of that fountain um, with those raw ingredients. The, the, I, I think they. I, I think Jane, Jane said it as well. If you have more than one hypothesis, so you're you're talking about, frankly, a, a Frankenstein of a of an idea, that's that's not one experiment. And you're not even going to be able to measure it right because you have to measure conversion, engagement, retention. Like, those are independent tests. So I think that's what's going on. Uh, try to get that nugget. Yeah. Oh. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Woo! Um, OK. Thank you, Adrian. That was great. All right. High five. Nice, nice work. OK, so um, I think that we should, we should go ahead and move on with our next talk. But I just want